you to the first installment of the Michael Triplett Speaker Series. Uh, as many of you know, this program was designed last year to honor the memory of Michael Triplett, who was NLGJ's president until his untimely passing last year. Michael was a, a true leader of this organization. He was a wise counsel to, to many of us and, and also a dear friend. And it's an understatement to say that we, we miss him terribly, especially during, uh, during conventions like this. He, uh, a lot of what we present to you every day is, be, is because of his leadership and his mission. And he was an incredible person to be with, to work with, and, and we truly, truly miss him. Michael was as passionate about his faith and his Lutheran community as he was about his work, uh, as he was about the work of LGBT journalists. And we designed this program to explore the intersection of faith, the LGBT community, and journalism. To have journalists hear from prominent leaders in the faith community and raise new questions about the complex relationship between support for LGBT rights and free religious expression. And I think Michael would be incredibly honored and excited about the program that we have for you this morning and would be up even this early in the morning to come see it. Uh, so let me welcome uh, our guests this morning. First, the Reverend Dr. Guy Irwin is Bishop of the Southwest California Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. He is the first openly gay bishop of the ELCA, and as an active member of the Osage Nation, he is the first Native American bishop in the denomination. Reverend Irwin is the Gerhard and Olga J. Belton Professor of Lutheran Confessional Theology at California Lutheran University, where he has taught since 2000. He did his undergraduate work at Harvard University and his graduate studies at Eberhard Karls University in Tübingen, the University of Leipzig, and Yale University. In 2004, he was appointed to the Faith and Order Commission of the World Council of Churches. Prior to coming to California in 2000, he was a lecturer in church history and historical theology at Yale Divinity School from 1993 to 1999. Erwin and his husband, Rob Flynn, are members of St. Matthew's Lutheran Church in North Hollywood, California. Uh, also joining us in, um, on your right is the Right Reverend V. Jean Robinson, who was elected Bishop of the, uh, of the Episcopal Diocese of New Hampshire in 2003. He had, having served as canon of the ordinary for nearly 18 years. He was consecrated as Bishop on All Saints Sunday in 2003, was invested as the ninth Bishop of New Hampshire in 2004, and retired as Bishop of New Hampshire in 2013. He graduated from the University of the South with a degree in American Studies and History, and received his Master's of Divinity at the General Theological Seminary in New York. After being ordained deacon and then priest, he served as curate at Christ Church in Ridgewood, New Jersey. The co-author of three AIDS education curricula for youth and adults, Robinson has done AIDS work in the United States and in Africa. And his book, In the Eye of the Storm, Swept to the Center by God, was published in 2008. Robinson has been active in the LGBT civil rights community, working at the state, national, and international level. He has spoken and lobbied for equal protection under the law and full civil marriage rights. He is currently a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress in Washington and is bishop in residence at St. Thomas Episcopal Church in Washington. And our moderator this morning is Jason DeRose, the Western Bureau Chief and Senior Editor for NPR News. Jason oversees news coverage from reporters and editors and freelancers in 13 Western states where nearly one third of NPR's listeners live. These pieces are air nationally on Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Weekend Edition. The best part of his job, he says, is that he visits each of his states every year. Before his current position, uh, Jason was a business and economics editor at NPR News and edited the, new, uh, the midday news magazine Day to Day. He holds a Master's in Divinity from the University of Chicago and spends a decade covering religion for WBEZ in Chicago and NPR. He's also president of his Lutheran congregation in Santa Monica, California. Jason, thank you. I want to frame our conversation today around three scenes. First, it's a close-up of your personal experiences as openly gay bishops, religious leaders in the public eye. 
the second scene is the middle is the middle distance view of the current intersection of religion, LGBTQ issues, and public life. Um, I don't usually use the word politics because I think that describes that whatever that is that's going on in Washington. But I think public life is more capacious. And third, um, a wide shot of what you think some of the new frontiers for people of faith um, in the LGBT community in public life might be. And then we're going to have time for some questions at the end, so be thinking of questions to ask um, yourselves out there. So let's start with the close-up. The two of you were elected a decade apart. Um, Bishop Robinson, you in 2003. Bishop Irwin, you in 2013. Now, Bishop Robinson, I think everybody in this room knew who you were uh, when, they, when they got their uh, program. I'm not sure that's the case with, uh, with Bishop Irwin. So I'd like to begin by asking each of you to evaluate how you have been seen, how you saw yourselves portrayed in the media, perhaps uh, Bishop Robinson, from over the course of time, and then uh, Bishop Irwin just for the last year. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Congratulations on being up. Uh, we'll all go to the clubs tonight. Um, so it was a, uh, an incredibly uh, turbulent time, uh, being the first openly gay and partner person elected bishop in Christendom. It was a, it was a big news story, and uh, when I describe a, a bit of what's happened in the last ten years, I often I often mention Guy because. On the, on the day after I was consecrated, or uh, uh, elected, uh, my picture was on the front page of every newspaper virtually in the world. And on the day after Guy's uh, consecration, I couldn't even find the story in the LA Times where it actually took place. And I think that's a, a, a if you will, a snapshot of, of where the culture has moved and where uh, some religious uh, institutions have moved in that 10-year period. Um, and I guess at this point I would say that uh, one of the uh, criticisms leveled against progressive religious groups about their increasingly positive stand on LGBT issues is that we're following the culture. And what I always say in response to that is, you know, sometimes God works in the culture. When the church won't cooperate, right? God is going to have God's way with justice, uh, with or without the church. And if the church won't lead, then uh, God will work in the culture. And I think this is uh, one of those interesting periods of time uh, in which God has needed to accomplish God's work uh, in the culture. Um, uh, one of the interesting things around the press and media coverage was that um, I had no ramp up time. Uh, I, I didn't get to be a little bit famous and then a little bit more famous and then a little bit more famous and then kind of ease into this role. Uh, on, on Friday I was just Gene Robinson. On Saturday I was elected. On Sunday um, it, it, you know, it was a firestorm. On Monday morning I'm sitting with Matt Lauer on the Today Show uh, with a, a friend of the PR uh, kind of person trying to give me a cram course in how not to look like a deer caught in the headlights. Um, so that part of it was uh, both uh, uh, horrifying and, and actually kind of fascinating. Um, I, uh, I've been treated really well by the press and by the media. Um, this same uh, person who was giving me the cram course said, look, this is a group of people just trying to do their jobs. If you help them do their jobs, they'll treat you well. And, um, and that, that has stood me in good stead in terms of actually developing relationships uh, with uh, members of the media. And, and, I, and I have to say, I, I've made a, a lot of people that I would consider to be uh, very, very good friends. So I, I felt really well treated. The one thing that ir irritated uh, early on was uh, uh, you, you just didn't see the words Bishop Gene Robinson without openly gay or gay. And for a couple of years, I, I resisted the gay bishop. I, I kept saying, I just want to be a good bishop, not a gay bishop. And then it, it, it finally dawned on me that um, this was a, a, a wonderful opportunity that, uh, that I believe God was putting in front of me. 
and that to, to uh, push against and resist the, the gay moniker was to be a very bad steward of a very great opportunity. And so rather than pushing against it, I decided that I would embrace it and, uh, and use it uh, as best I could uh, for, the, for the good of uh, our community. And, and uh, so it, it, it got to be very much more peaceful. The last thing sort of personal I would say is that for the first two years, I was, uh, I was getting uh, almost daily death threats. And, uh, and while I suspected that there would be a, uh, uh, a bit of controversy around my election, I don't think any of us uh, thought it would be as big a story uh, as it actually turned out to be. And I think that was just a, uh, uh, the intersection of, of, of several things happening all at once, and, and, and I seem to be a symbol for that. And um, so, uh, uh, personally, I, I tried to keep track of who I was and not believe the press about me, either the positive or the negative, uh, because neither of those were actually true. And, and I think one of the one of the challenges, personal challenges, of being in a situation like this is, is holding on to who you are and, and, uh, and not believing yourself to either be the angel that one side will paint you to be or the devil that the other uh, paints you to be. So, Bishop Urban, fast forward 10 years. You were elected. In the interest of full disclosure, I was a delegate to the Synod Assembly that elected um, Reverend Irwin, Bishop Irwin. Um, so, fast forward 10 years. Um, you were elected on, I believe, a Saturday afternoon? It was. Um, what a difference a decade makes. Uh, it's great for me to have a chance, actually, to say for the first time publicly how grateful I am for Bishop Robinson's leadership because he kicked the door open that it was then possible for others to come through. And it's been a much easier ride for me. I had the, the, the proverbial 15 minutes of fame, literally. It, it lasted about 48 hours total. The morning after my election, my picture was on the front page of the newspaper in Madrid. But then it dropped from sight, really, after that. I, I kind of followed how it went around the world, and it was very interesting for me as a, as a novice in this to see who copied whom in terms of the reporting that went around the world. There were some inaccuracies in one of the early stories about my election that then got amplified as it went around. Nothing important, but it was just interesting to watch. Um, the, like Gene, I discovered that I had gone through a door I really wasn't fully aware I was going through until it was over. And all that attention all at once was a little bewildering. But, uh, but of course, I had seen him go through it. And I, and I knew to be calm and that this would indeed die down a bit. But in terms of the actual focus on it, much, much less, of course, than a decade before. We've become a little more used to the idea, even though uh, the communion of Lutheran churches around the world is very, very large and significant, like that of the Anglican Church. It's churches. It's still just another milestone along the way. And I think with each iteration, each new frontier that's crossed, there might be less media attention, simply because this is the way that many kinds of churches are going. Now, I understand that the uh, news media did play a role in your relationship. Yes, indeed, because. I was elected, and then almost immediately after that, uh, Doma was then Prop 8 were overturned by the Supreme Court. And that juxtaposition was one that no one anticipated. And it was actually on an, in an NPR interview that I was asked by the interviewer, I prepared myself for every possible question, but not for this one, was asked whether I now intended to marry my partner of 19 years. And I said, well, I suppose so. I'll have to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and of course, then I got home, and, and by then, Rob had already posted on Facebook that he thought he had been proposed to, <laughs> which indeed turns out to have been the case. Uh, so, Bishop Robinson, what, what has been the hardest part of, of living your life so publicly over the last decade? You know, what's been the toll? Coffee's Um The... Well, it's, it's several different, uh, difficult parts. Uh, but the actual hardest part was being a good bishop, right? It's actually not an easy job. Uh, and 
and in, in some ways, uh, I, I felt like I had two jobs. I had this more than full-time job as the Bishop of New Hampshire, which any bishop uh, would have. And then I had this other thing going on, which was the, this uh, huge interest uh, around the world and, and all of the um, uh, opportunities that, that came for, for doing that. So uh, it was difficult uh, uh, keeping that in proportion. I, I wanted my folks in New Hampshire to understand that they were the most, my most important priority. Uh, at the same time, I, I felt like I, I needed to use this uh, for the for the greater good, I guess. Um, all the negativity uh, is is difficult, um, and you almost have to uh, begin to regard yourself as a third person, or, or from, you know from a third person stance. It's sort of like a, Gene Robinson in the media was was this other thing out there. And uh, again, it was part of my effort to uh, not, uh, not believe and focus on all the positive and negative uh, uh, things that were, that were a part of that experience. Um, oddly enough, this, this may um, come as a surprise, and I think Guy would be interested in it, uh, to ask you about this. So, um, so I've been out for like, you know, since God was a little boy, right? I mean, I've been out for a very long time. And, uh, and so that was no, uh, no news, certainly, to, to my diocese who elected me. Once I became the gay bishop, I felt really um, reticent to talk about gay stuff. And I virtually never talked about anything LGBT in the diocese of New Hampshire. It was not an issue there. It was not what I was doing there. Uh, and frankly, not many people were interested in it. They had elected me their bishop. They wanted me to be a good bishop, and so on. And uh, and so there was always this play about. Uh, it, it seemed like my brother and sister bishops could talk about the gay issue easier than I could, uh, because everyone would see me as being self-serving and uh, pushing my own agenda, and so on and so forth. And, and they could say exactly the same things and not, and not be so abused. Uh, so I think that was hard. Um, and while I uh, was treated really, really well by my fellow bishops, uh, with, with the possible exception of those who ultimately left the Episcopal Church over this, uh, uh, I never felt my otherness more than at the House of Bishops meetings. It was not that anyone did anything. Um, These are the international meetings. Uh, um, in mostly just the, the Episcopal Church here in, in, in this country. Although it's important to point out that there are 16 countries in the American Episcopal Church. But, um, uh, well, and then of course in 2008 I was excluded from the worldwide conference of Anglican Bishops, which has taken place every 10 years since 1867. And it was the first time any bishop in the worldwide Anglican Communion had ever been excluded from that conference. But you went anyway. So I went anyway. Uh, <laughs> despite, despite what my mother had always told me about not going places you're not welcome, I was just not willing to let those guys, it was the guys that were having the problems, right? The women are just fine. Um, but the, the men bishops, uh, I was not going to let them meet for three weeks and pretend that there weren't people like me sitting in their pews back in Uganda and Sri Lanka and, and Chile, right? Uh, and it was a really, honestly, it was a very, very stupid thing for the Archbishop of Canterbury to exclude me and leave me just outside the conference with all the media. <laughs> so I was doing interviews and, and TV spots and, and on all the major shows in, in England and uh, you know the, the BBC World Service became my best friend and um, if, if, if he had invited me to the conference, I would have gone in and been going out of my way to be the good boy, right? Um, but 
being on the edge of the conference just connected me with so many people on the fringes of the church. And, uh, and you know, to meet a young woman who was from Uganda, who came out to her parents, her parents took her to the local uh, police station uh, so that she could be raped by all the men at the police station to cure her of being a lesbian. I wouldn't have met that woman in the conference, you know? And yet, that, that, was, that was who those bishops should have been talking to. So it was a, a rich experience, but, uh, but it, was a, it was a pretty unhealthy dose of, of being excluded. Uh, and in fact, probably that three weeks was the, the most difficult time of the 10 years that I was a bishop. So that was in 2008? 2008. So Bishop Irwin, you have, did you describe any, any experiences of feeling excluded from within your own denomination? Not really so much. It's, it, it hasn't been my experience, because this is another aspect of a, ten, of a decade later thing. But we also, as, a, as an international church, Lutherans are not so focused on our visible unity. So there, weren't, there haven't been opportunities for me to be excluded, and I can't imagine that they would occur. Um, the, the thing I would report that is a similar feeling is that when I arrived at my first meeting of our National Conference of Bishops, we have 65 bishops across the United States, I was very, made very welcome by almost all of them, and even the ones who had reservations, I have something personal in common with. They're, they tend to be a little traditional, and I am too in some ways, and so they had a hard time maintaining any barrier against me because, in fact, they liked me and they thought that I was going to be on their side of some issues. So that was, that was helpful. But the thing that really astounded me was to be in that room of these 65 men and women and realize the conversation there about gay and lesbian people was never going to be the same because I was in the room. And even though I, and, and one of the bizarre aspects of this is that of course I became by my election immediately a spokesperson for gay people in the church, and I'm no expert on that. I happen to be one, but it's never been the focus of my work. I'm a historian and a theologian, and it's not, it, I, I can tell you anything you want to know about Martin Luther, but really about, <laughs> about the lives of gay people in America and the world today, I had to catch up a little to be able to talk about that, and, uh, and that was a surprise. So I find myself having to speak for issues about which I don't feel like I'm the most qualified person around. And of course, we all know that you don't even have to be gay to be able to speak with knowledge and compassion about the situation of gay people.